What is love? The absence of love, the end of love, the need for love, result in so much violence. I had read it and loved it, and um, then when I heard Sarah was directing it, I uh, emailed her kind of incessantly. And we could not endure any more violence. Today on Encore, the story of an isolated religious community battered by sexual abuse. I wasn't, like, shocked by it. Isn't that horrible? No, I wasn't shocked by it either. Women Talking stars Rooney Mara, Claire Foy, Jesse Buckley and Frances McDormand, amongst others. It's a New York Times article, isn't it, that was written about it. Um, when you read it, it's terrible. And then, But then what's extraordinary is Miriam's book takes that story and turns it into sort of a fable, and Sarah kind of lent on that even more. Canadian writer-director Sarah Polly's adaptation of Miriam Tay's 2018 novel is based on a real-life mass rape case in a Mennonite community in Bolivia, where over four years men drugged wives, daughters and mothers and raped them, blaming ghosts, demons and hysteria. We know that we've not imagined these attacks. We know that we are bruised and terrified. So, Polly, hello. Hi. Congratulations on the film. The whole audience were glued to their seats um, oh, when the credits rolled, processing what had happened in the film. It's not the first time you've adapted Canadian author's stories. What was it about this book that made you want to bring it to the screen and make your first film in a decade? I fell in love with this book when I read it. I thought the questions were so complex and nuanced, and this debate between these women was so alive and fruitful. And I just was so excited by the idea of finding the best actors I possibly could to have this debate, because I think what it is really is this radical act of democracy, this sense of what does it mean for people to sit in a room who don't agree with each other um, and have to come to some kind of consensus to move forward. And the whole experiment of that just really riveted me. We were given two days to forgive the attackers before they returned. We hardly knew how to read or to write. But that day, we learned how to vote. Do nothing. Stay and fight. Leave. Leave. They're debating whether they should stay and fight, stay and do nothing, or whether they should leave. And all of those three decisions are huge. They can seem like quite small, like, oh, just get up and go. But it's like they're massive, massive decisions these women are trying to make. And they've got the responsibility for the entire colony of deciding. And that's a, a big thing. And they've got to do a lot of talking about it. If we do not forgive these men, we forfeit our place in heaven. Surely there must be something worth living for in this life, not only the next. We cannot forgive because we are forced to. You did gather some incredible mm -hmm. um, actors. Frances McDormand has a small role in the film as well as producing it, and the cast um, includes Claire Foy, her character, mm -hmm is full of um, rage and wants revenge, while Jesse Buckley's character is more ambivalent. Did you always know who was going to play which role? I didn't. I felt like it was kind of like putting together a theatre company and then figuring out where people fit in relation to each other. So I've imagined all those actors in different roles than they played. And it's where we eventually came to, both in terms of how that would play with the other actors, but also in terms of what each actor was really drawn to. So Claire was very drawn to Salome, even though I first met her for Salome or for Ona. Rooney Mara was very drawn to Ona. And I think I first met her for Marike. So everybody kind of shifted around and it was like just creating this organism and figuring out how people would work together. What if the men who are in prison are not guilty? Mother. Oh, oh Charlie. Why are you asking if they shush. We caught one of them. Ah! I saw him. But only one. Yes, only one, but he named the others. But what if he was lying? There's a lot of fear in her. Um, I think she's learned to survive through fear by just kind of buttoning, battening down the hatches. And it was really hard to play her. She, she kind of broke me apart. <laughs> you can laugh all you like, Salome, but we will be forced to leave the colony if we don't forgive the men. How will Lord, when he arrives, find the women if we aren't in the colony? Jesus is able to return to life, live for thousands of years, and then drop down to earth from heaven to scoop up his supporters. Surely he'd also be able to locate a few women Let's who left their colony. Let's stay on track. All right, I'll stay on track. I cannot forgive them. 
She has such a huge amount of anger and it is very righteous. It's coming from a place where she is justifiably angry. Um, but also that her anger is a protection against something else, which is accepting what has happened to herself, her family, her child, um, and the women in general, and the position they've been put in. One of the crucial decisions you made and that you've talked a lot about is not to show the rape scenes. Mm -hmm. The film is about how they process the aftermath. Why this choice? It felt unimportant to me to see the details of the rapes. I think what was very important is the moment after. So we do show the moment after the assaults. Um, that moment where the brain is chaos and it's very difficult to, to capture the details of what's happened into memory. And that felt important in terms of their experience moving forward, but ultimately the film was about them finding a way forward together and moving in community towards some kind of healing, not about the horror of the assaults themselves. So we don't shy away from talking about it, but I also think when you show sexual assault on screen, it can so easily go sideways, whether you intend it to or not. I think it can so easily become somehow fetishized or sensationalized and it's very rarely additive, I think. So I, I, I can't think of many examples where I think it was necessary to show it on, on screen. So I'm just, in general, didn't feel drawn to do that anyway. In terms of the material itself, it is a heavy subject. Sexual abuse survivors coming together. You had a therapist mm -hmm. on set. What was the mood like? I mean, we did our absolute best to make it feel like a healthy working environment. So, and that meant a lot of laughter and a lot of joy. Um, <laughs> We had shorter working hours than usual in North America. It's probably very normal here, but in North America, it was very short working hours. We talk, did have talk a, about that a minute because sure. that was a big decision that you made. Um, as a mum of three um, young children, yeah. you decided that um, you weren't going to do the usual 16 hour days. Yeah, I mean, for me, I just wouldn't have directed a film again until my kids were a lot older if I'd had to work the regular sort of North American film set hours. So. That was a sort of boundary I put up really early and I had really great support from Frances McDormand and Dee Dee Gardner, um, the producers, in supporting that and creating this, this different kind of environment. And then we had Laurie Haskell, this amazing therapist on set, who was available to the crew and the cast at any point. She could be phoned, she was there for the more difficult scenes and that really helped as well. And we had a rule that anytime anyone needed a break, they just took it, that we would not have this sort of emergency room mentality that can happen on film sets. We had to literally hold each other up on and off set and also laugh and, you know, keep it light and kind of just be with each other. And um, every single woman and Ben in, in that room, we were all we all had each other's back. It was tough. Like it was really there were some really tough, long, hard, brutal, technically difficult days, but we just got through it together. Um, and I, I don't think I'll ever have an experience like it again. One of the big um, questions in the film is, should we forgive? Mm -hmm. uh, you've written about your own experiences of abuse and trauma. Mm -hmm. Have you come to your own conclusion about that question? Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting about forgiveness is it's not necessarily an end point or a destination. I think it can come and go. So I think for the most part, I do live in a state of basic forgiveness. I don't feel like I carry along a lot of active anger and grief. I think I've worked through a lot of that over, I've had a lot of decades to work through that and do therapy and meditation and all of the things. I do think that I'm in a general state of forgiveness, but I don't think that that can be relied upon to stay stagnant. And I also don't think it needs to be an end goal for everybody. I mean, I think that's where I am in my life and that's what I find helpful. It's both men and women who need to unlearn things so they can learn something new. Yeah, it's not about blame no. or retribution. Our choice will be your future. In um, your book that came out last year, Run Towards the Danger, you write about being in unsafe environments on set when you were a child actress. Um, how does that experience affect the way that you interact with your own actors? Um, I think that I'm just very interested in figuring out all the ways um, that there can be the presence of care on a film set because I think we've become so accustomed to this idea that great art can't be made without a lot of difficulty and tumult and, and torture for everybody involved. And so I think just figuring out how to debunk that in a real way, practically on set every day, becomes a real focus for me. So how do we put the experience of making this film, uh, how do we make it a priority alongside making a film that we're proud of, like how do we make that intrinsic to what our intentions are? She's not like 
a dictator. She's a real enabler and a, and a truth sayer and somebody who can hold all those huge energies and points of view is a very, very special person. And I'm forever grateful that I've had this chance to work with her in my life. I know your children were on the set at one point and they're interested in acting. And would you, what would you say to them if they wanted to become ch child actors? I think we've decided as a society that kids shouldn't work, and I find it always so odd that we make an exception for the film industry, which is probably one of the last places I would think um, kids would be happy and healthy and taken care of. So in my mind, I'm very happy to support them doing school stuff or acting clubs or theater programs that are designed in the best interest of kids. But in terms of a professional environment, I would highly discourage it. Now you've said that working with Catherine Bigelow uh, two decades ago opened your eyes to how challenging it was mm. for women directors in the industry. Do you think things have changed now? I think things have certainly changed somewhat. So I think that the cultural conversation that's happened in the last several years has helped, for sure, having had 10 years off being a filmmaker and coming back. I feel like some of the obstacles have been removed, but certainly not all of them. And uh, there's certainly a, a very long way to go. So you're not going to wait another 10 years to make another film? I hope not. I mean, I don't want to make films just for the sake of making films. So if I feel as urgent about a film as I did about this one, I'll absolutely make one. But I think I have to have that same sense of urgency to make one. Sarah Polly, thank, thank you so you. much. Nice to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. How would you feel if in your entire life it never mattered what you thought? And we've liberated ourselves. We will have to ask ourselves who we are. Thank you.